So thanks for having me. I want to jump right into it and uh, try to, you know, I won't get us all the way back on track, but time-wise, but uh, maybe get us halfway there. So first, my disclosure slide. Uh, most of the data that I show you from my lab is funded by NIH. Uh, NARSAD, a great organization, and this nice foundation. I do have relationships, uh, like Terry mentioned, with a lot of pharmaceutical companies. I, I think, like Terry, I'm a believer that uh, uh, an effective partnership between industry and academics is a lot better than just industry doing it on its own uh, with nobody watching. Okay. So to the talk, you know, why did this topic get traction? Uh, it, it's funny. It, it actually, this is an old story. We, we've known this, uh, if you look in the literature, for, for decades. Uh, but the story got a lot of traction when this paper, this uh, journal article, uh, showed up, uh, reported on the front page of USA, USA Today top half. And it was a, a CMS, SAMHSA funded study, multiple US states, multiple years, looking at the average age of death in the general population in those states in those years, comparing it to the average age of death in the mentally ill population in the public sector, you know, that the governor in each state was responsible for, not to put too fine a point on it. And, and what it found was that patients with major mental disorders were dying 25 to 30 years earlier than folks in the general population. And that, you know, front page of the paper, uh, the, the story was that the state was somehow not delivering high quality medical care uh, and that there was blowback and political consequences within the states. And I think it got a lot of attention. So a lot of the states that we've worked in uh, ended up now focusing efforts on trying to understand this and remediate it. The other piece was that it wasn't, so, so as psychiatrists, you know, I was trained um, in the mid-1980s, and, and we were trained to think of suicide as the leading cause of death in the mentally ill population. And I think where that came from is when you're talking relative risk, the relative risk of suicide in the general population is so low that when you look at suicide in the mentally ill population, relative risk rates are, you know, double digit. But when you talk about absolute risk, the number of deaths you know, in the mentally ill population f due to suicide versus due to other causes, it turns out coronary heart disease is a leading cause of death in the mentally ill population, just like it is in the rest of the developed world. Um, in, and if you add together coronary heart disease, diabetes, cerebrovascular disease, all macrovascular atherosclerotic processes, a huge chunk of the excess mortality is related to uh, this underlying process. So people started thinking about it. Uh, and and the, we've advanced the thesis that this really isn't that mysterious, that you can understand why patients with major mental illness die sooner and more often of cardiovascular disease by just looking at how they have a higher prevalence of all the very well-established key modifiable risk factors. And uh, this, uh, pay, this commentary is in your handouts. Uh, so higher rates of uh, lipid abnormalities, somehow obesity dropped off of this one. It should be obesity, diabetes, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, I'll define it for you, smoking. And then, of course, reduced access to high-quality medical care never helped anybody live longer. Poverty never helped anybody live longer. Okay. So very briefly, I want to sort of, because it helps us when we think about the guidelines, I want to just go back to basics on a couple of points. One is that this is the nurse's health study. Uh, Graham Colditz moved to WashU a few years ago. Um, and body mass index in women and in men, uh, these are folks followed for multiple years. Uh, this is relative risk. Notice single digit increases in relative risk for a number of different medical conditions. Notice two things on the slide. One is a steep curve for type 2 diabetes. And also notice that we're seeing the relative risk of these different medical conditions go up as you creep up the normal and overweight range. We aren't even into obesity for most ethnic groups. Now, I, d I say most ethnic groups because World Health Organization and the NIH has pointed out that for uh, Asian Americans, including Indian Asians, uh, really we should probably move the thresholds, the definitions for overweight and obesity down a notch. So where in Caucasians and African Americans, 25 is the threshold for overweight, 30 is the threshold for obese. 
Uh, actually, that should probably be 23 and 25 for Asian populations. And it's because the curves shift to the left. And you start seeing morbidity and mortality at the lower levels of adiposity. Now, what happens? Let's just pick on women for a second, and let's pick on the steep curve for type 2 diabetes. What happens when you move the BMI out above 30? Okay, in the same study, nurses' health study. And notice, again, single-digit increases in relative risk. So same study, nurses' health study. When you move the BMI above 30, notice you go from the single-digit increases in risk to these double-digit increases. So you can get 50, 60 times the risk of type 2 diabetes for a woman in her middle years who hits a BMI above 35 just underscoring why the Centers for Disease Control, American Diabetes Association, U.S. Public Health Service in general, is so keen on focusing on obesity, adiposity uh, in general, as a risk factor for type 2 disease. Uh, another sort of back to basics thing, so we're all on the same page, I'll take a minute and just walk you through the time course for type 2 diabetes. So type 2 is 95% of the diabetes in the world. And it starts really probably 20 years before your diagnosis. In people who have genetic or familial risk, you begin by increasing your adiposity, uh, your fatness, increasing your fatness, decreasing your fitness, and you develop tissue insensitivity to insulin, a reduced tissue sensitivity to insulin, also called insulin resistance. And as your tissues become less sensitive to insulin, even in people at risk, uh, your pancreatic beta cells do a really nice compensatory thing. They start putting out more insulin to try to overcome the insulin resistance. And for the first seven to 10 years, your fasting glucose and your postprandial, your post meal or post load glucose stays under pretty good control. So if we want to go and screen for type 2 diabetes risk in those initial years, you won't find it by looking at post meal, postprandial, postload glucose, glycated hemoglobin, none of that will help. You have to look for signs of insulin resistance. The other point on the slide is that when we go looking in studies, you know, studies in psychiatric patients, and what they've been looking for is the glucose signal. Okay, so if we're studying kids, for example, or young adults, and they're somewhere in this early seven to 10 years, you can put on a lot of adiposity, you can increase insulin resistance massively and not see any glucose signal. So clinical trials in general are not a good way to get at diabetes risk. You have to look at longer windows of observation. Okay, uh, I like the flickering, but the, uh, the, the other point I wanted to make here is about the sort of insulin resistance syndrome and the metabolic syndrome early on called Syndrome X. This was another Stanford thing. Jerry Reven, a guy at Stanford, at first uh, called it the Reven Syndrome. <laughs> and then uh, he decided people gave him grief about it, so he called it Syndrome X. Uh, now it's the Insulin Resistance Syndrome. And, and it's evolved into other cousins, like Metabolic Syndrome. But it's this notion, now we understand, really it's shared risk for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And there are a number of modifiable as well as non-modifiable risk factors. We're particularly interested in the way overweight and obesity uh, really increases in adiposity, can have direct effects on risk, and also drive risk by changing insulin sensitivity. And insulin resistance ends up being associated with a characteristic dyslipidemia. It's not your LDL going up, and it's not your total cholesterol going up. It's your triglycerides going up in general, and your HDL or good cholesterol going down. Blood pressure tends to go up. This blood pressure signal happens more in African Americans. The triglyceride signal happens more in Caucasian populations. So it's hard to come up with a one-size-fits-all. Uh, glucose, you know, eventually will go up. So just to give you a peek, uh, it, it, this is the Katy study and baseline data from Katy. So this is an NIH-funded study, uh, almost 1,500 patients entering with schiz chronic schizophrenia, pre previously treated, entering at 57 diverse sites around the U.S. Uh, and this is data before they start the Katy treatments. They've had other psychiatric treatments in the past. And it's only a subset of the Katie sample because not everybody had confirmed fasting blood values. 
So top line result here, comparing men and women with schizophrenia to men and women in the general population from NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Top line result, men and women with schizophrenia have about twice the general population prevalence of metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome, this constellation of insulin resistance related metabolic risk factors that can drive risk for both type 2 and uh, cardiovascular disease. But what I thought was much more interesting was drill down into the individual criteria. There's a waist circumference criteria, a triglyceride criteria, HDL, blood pressure, and glucose. And basically, all of the individual criteria are also happening at a higher rate. It wasn't only one smoking gun. It was the whole gamish. So, uh, in, and in fact, the only thing that wasn't significant was in the men, the glucose criteria wasn't different than the general population, but you guys now get that. That's because in young adults, you know, it's easy to have no glucose signal as long as you've got a little pancreatic reserve left. Let's wait a few years and you'll see a glucose signal. Okay. Okay. So, you know, we think the other major reason that uh, and here's to the interventions. The other major reason that we're seeing this premature morbidity and mortality in the mentally ill population happens to do with failures in primary and secondary prevention, which we might target by public health efforts in our states. Um, this population now very well documented to be less likely to be screened for and treated for all the you know, well-characterized modifiable risk factors, less likely if they get cardiovascular disease. Uh, ben Druss and others at Emory have shown you go into a general hospital emergency room and you have a myocardial infarction you, and you have a mental health condition, you're much less likely to get to the surgical suite for coronary artery bypass graft or angioplasty. Um, and then if you survive the event in the year following, you're much less likely to receive drugs of proven benefit. And then I think it's not shocking, actually, that you would then be more likely to have subsequent uh, events. Unrelated point, but I just wanted to get it out there. So, so a lot of us have heard the story that untreated schizophrenia is somehow itself associated with a higher risk for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And I want you to understand there's about five papers that might shed light on this, uh, and the results are completely mixed. So, and in fact, there's a bigger sample size in the studies that say that there's no difference between schizophrenia, untreated schizophrenia patients and general population folks with respect to diabetes risk. For depression, on the other hand, very clear signal from large-scale epidemiologic studies that, that even, oops, even untreated depression has an increased risk for type 2 diabetes. But it's a very fascinating story we could go into some other time about a state-related effect. So you treat the depression and the risk goes away. You know, if you have uh, a depressed diabetic and you treat their depression, their glycemic control improves even as you don't change any of their anti-diabetic meds. Okay. Uh, so to the, you know, to the thing we're talking about today, risk, and what do the drugs do to risk? Uh, there's a very strong story for what drugs do to weight and adiposity, insulin resistance, and these other things. I'll give you a quick survey. So, so this, is, this is back to, to Terry's uh, talk and some of the dialogue we were having. You know, you can think about adverse events in a few different ways. You can think about them as categorical events, yes, no, yes, no sedation, yes, no weight gain. Um, or you can think about them a as continuously distributed variables. You know, what's the mean change or in an individual, how much weight gain did they have? Rather than did they hit a 7% increase in body weight from the baseline in the study? The FDA for many years reported on the 7% metric. No one knows who invented the 7% metric, literally. You can't find anyone who will admit. Or, or claims any knowledge of why that's there. It's not a crazy number if you now have to backfill a uh, rationale for it. In weight loss studies, uh, behavioral and pharmacologic weight loss studies, even in the best you know, um, weight loss clinics in academic medical centers, you really can't deliver more than about a 5 to 10% sustained loss in body weight over time. 
So 7% might be sort of, you can think of it as the threshold that we don't have any tools to undo if you go beyond that. Okay, so, but this is this arbitrary 7% increase from, uh, in body weight from baseline for all the second generation antipsychotics from the US package inserts. Um, really important here, don't compare the colored bars to each other. Compare the colored bar to its own placebo because, right, it was a different group of hospitals, a different epoch, a uh, different cohort of patients. And, and the point, sort of backing up some messages that you got from Terry, the point is there are no weight neutral antipsychotics. I mean, that's just not true. Uh, using the 7% metric, aripiprazole produces twice the placebo rate of weight gain, zepracidone twice the placebo rate, at least at the 12 milligram dose, twice the placebo rate here, twice the placebo rate. Here's three and a half times the placebo rate for quetiapine, 10 times the placebo rate for olanzapine. The centipine's a little over two. Iloperidone gets up to about four. Uh, and loracidone actually, less than two times the placebo rate of weight gain, but it's probably just a cohort effect. So I would say the best you can do is about twice the placebo rate of weight gain with that kind of metric.